that was really good stuff at the start. And my, my mate Mark was always like, just hit record from straight away in case you yeah. get some like nuggets at the start. And I already yeah. missed one. <laughs> interesting women's basketball though for you uh i well i i'm a basketball fan i think that's that's the genesis of everything um yeah. and i applied for the uh for media for the women's world cup at the end of 2022 yeah. and i got it approved the same day that my niece was born right. and it was just like that's the best day of my life like yeah. I got like my niece was born. I was like, this is awesome. I'm, I'm an uncle now. And then that night I got that approved and I was like, wait, <laughs> I'm in one day I became an uncle and now I'm a FIBA accredited media member. <laughs> like yeah. that, that stacks up pretty well on paper. Then I covered the world cup and I was like, I really like, I've been, I've been a fan of, I want to say the WNBA for four, four or five years. And then the WNBL for three years. Yeah. And I think the main like reason I hadn't gotten into those leagues yet is because the NBA just has so much stuff on all the time. And then, yeah. and then I had this like point of self-reflection and I was like, if I'm really a basketball fan, then how am I only a fan of one league? And I just yeah. gave all like, well, I watch heaps of different leagues now. Uh, I think international competitions help you get into the domestic competitions. Yeah. Um, and it's like, it's just basketball. And I think that people have all these biases and these walls put up, especially with, you know, uh, women basketball players, women athletes. Um, but, but like, as, uh, you know, a fanalist, uh, yeah. I, I like, it's just basketball. Like, I don't know how else to describe it. Like, it's just basketball. They do all the, it's just, like, I don't know, I don't know how else yeah. to say it. Like, it's just basketball. I can go watch it in person. Uh, yeah. I can interview these players. I can get these half an hour pod, to an hour podcasts. Yeah. Um, and it's just like, it's people overcomplicate it, but, it, but it's just, it's just basketball yeah I would I agree with you I think the challenge is and if I speak to guys who follow NBA because NBA is massive right globally mm. um, and there are lots and lots and lots and lots of people that follow NBA and nothing else so not even the NBL um, certainly not women's basketball their their argument is that the women aren't as athletic there's no dunking you know there's all that sort of stuff so the reality of it is it's the same game but it's played very differently like and you obviously would get this the women's is far more strategic and far more um i mean look they're they're super athletic and super skillful but men and women are built differently right that's just that's just the reality so it is a different type of game um which is where and i think i think the nba is very individual um i don't think defense is great this is my <laughs> views right um and then i think for all of that in women's basketball no matter where you watch it it's played hard all the time mm. and i think it ends sometimes it's not so it's interesting so like i'm a massive basketball fan as well i'm, I don't, I'm not that interested in the men's game because of that i don't like mm. the individual like I, I, I like to see more of a team game than an individual game yeah definitely <laughs> and i think the 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 thing that every other league in the world has that the NBA doesn't have the runtime of an NBA game is like two and a half hours. Yeah. It's a yeah. 48 minute game. Yeah. Uh, secondly, the amount of times you have to stop because someone's crying in the NBA or like yeah. arguing about a call or like, yeah. you know, Anthony Davis, how did you get poked in the eye again? And like yeah. the whole game has to stop for a minute or two. It's just like toughen up, just play. Like, it's just yeah. like, you've got and the look, best job in the world. Great so many stops as a mm, fan mm. You want less stops and more play mm. yeah yeah did you play growing up I did yeah I mm. you know I played basketball was kind of my um my sport of choice growing up I played mm. basketball and netball and I was lucky enough to be part of the Ca Canberra Capitals for a couple of years in the mm. part of their program in the late 90s which probably shows my age a bit so <laughs> yeah, um yeah, but I've always loved it. It's a great sport. It's and I'm you know, like I'm you know I'm 45 now and I've just started back playing again with some oh, friends no and stuff. So, uh, yeah, I love it. I love it. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I guess I should probably introduce the episode. I'll use. Yeah, I'll, I think I'll use a majority of that. Uh, I just got to figure out how to cut it. Yeah. Um, right. But this is the W Basketball Show. I'm your host Lucas, joined today by Christy Collier Hill, who you. You probably actually, uh, you've probably just heard her talking for about five minutes. 
uh, her and I talking. Um, and we'll get onto her professional life uh, officially in a bit. But how are you feeling after you had uh, a week and a half off work? And you, you mentioned you had a week in Singapore. How are you feeling after your time away? Yeah, I had a lovely week in Singapore away with my husband, which was great. A um, little bit of a refresh and re-energise and um, straight back into it, though, this week. Um, you know, the WNBL, as much as the season is finished and we kind of look forward to next season, the work never stops. So at league level and certainly at club level, all the administrators at club level, um, you know, we all work all year round. And it's uh, so six months on season, six months off season, but, gee, as an administrator, it's a hell of a lot of work that happens in the off season, both at league and club level. So, uh, yeah, it's never ending. But a break is always good to to give you a little bit more energy to keep going. Mm, for sure. When you do take a break, do you usually try and get away, or do you like mix in a staycation every once in a while? Try and get away. I think if you're, out, I like to be out of the house because if I'm in the house, <laughs> I'm always thinking about things to do. So. Mm. Um, Trying to get away from the house into a different environment is the best thing, I think. Yeah. And uh, I think, yeah, before we started recording, you mentioned that um, there's almost more work in the off season uh, than during the season. Because I guess the you, you kind of build up the machine and then once the season starts, the machine is running. Um, now your, your role is head of WNBR, which is just such an awesome job title. Um, but yeah, what does that entail on a weekly basis? Gosh, uh, there's no two weeks. Interestingly, there's no two weeks that are actually the same. But I suppose in a nutshell, my my job is to deliver the league, to make sure that it runs and that it is delivered and also to grow the league. So I've been in the role about two and a half years now. So I've had two full seasons under my belt in this role and going into my third. And one of the things I've been really big on in, in both of the two seasons I've been here is growth. So what can we do to grow the league um, and re realistically? So when I say realistically, I mean, you know, from a resource perspective, league and club land, we struggle a lot with, with resource, which is money and people. So what can we do with the resources that we've got to, to grow the league? And so um, that's always a challenge because it would be lovely to have way more money and way more people to be mm -hmm. able to do certain things. But, you know, we had some really big growth areas last year that we targeted and were able to get off the ground. For example, the WNBL app we got off the ground last year. We, we formally partnered with the WNBA last year and had the game showing on the WNBA app internationally. We got a, a heap of new international broadcast partners, which then, you know, were showing the WNBL in over 100 countries, you know, around the world last season, which was massive. Mm. Uh, we launched a new um, WNBL alumni program called the Trailblazers. We launched a formal partnership with Aussie Hoops to link, formally link the WNBL and the Aussie Hoops program. So all of that stuff was what I would term our growth initiatives from last season. So there's the league that's delivered and then there's how can we grow it in, in some particular strategic areas and they were the ones we identified and were able to, I suppose, successfully deliver last season, which, you know, when you think about it, they're all really good things. I mean, we always want to do more, right? But I think, again, probably given the resources that we've got, I think there's some really good growth elements that we were able to achieve there last season. Yeah, so would you say that uh, those were the biggest contributors to um, yeah having success in the most recent few seasons or I guess this season just passed? Well, I think success is it's a collective, right? So there's there's us at league level who are responsible for delivering the league. Then you've got at club level, you've got general managers, um, commission members and all the administration that sits there at club level that work their butts off. And I've worked at club level. I was with the Boomers before I was the Melbourne Boomers before this role. And it is a hard slog. It is a, yeah. around the clock in season it is very, very busy um, and certainly off season as well. So, um the, the work the league does, the work the clubs do, and the clubs work exceptionally hard, the work the athletes do both on the court and off the court all speaks to, to the growth of the league. And then you've got things, um, you know, I suppose stakeholders like the Players Association and the work they do, all of the sponsors and partners, both at league and club level. And certainly at league level, we've, had, we've just got some cracking partners um, that really do not just partner with the league, but but really promote it. And I know mm. at club level um, it's the same. There's just some wonderful partners right across the league. And then you've got media, right? So over the last few seasons, our media coverage has grown year on year, which is wonderful. And we've got more writers writing about the WNBL, 
more print um, for the WNBL than we've ever had before. So it's never it's never just one thing, but if mm. all of the stakeholders are contributing to to genuinely growing and wanting to grow the league, then that's that's how it grows. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and yeah, you've, you've spoken on growth quite a bit um, so far and mentioned that you've been uh, in your in this role for about two and a half years now, getting two full seasons. Now I want to do a little fact check while we're live on air. You are also a member of the 2022 FIBA Women's Basketball World Cup Marketing and Communications Advisory Committee. Is that correct? Oh, that's a mouthful. Yes, I was. <laughs> <laughs> Rolls off the tongue. Yeah. Um, I've, I've wanted to ask this question since the World Cup. But I need—I feel like I need a bit of like a sample size, and I need to ask the right person. I think now is the perfect time. Uh, how do you feel as though the success of hosting the World Cup has affected the imports the WNBL has been able to attract? The imports? Yeah. Interesting. That's an interesting question. Um, so there's no doubt that it has played an impact, and I mean, even the season we've just had, we had some absolutely cracking. Mm athletes you know you think the league mvp in jordan canada Erin mcdonald nas hillman um Didi richards you know these are all wnba stars not just just player stars so did the world cup impact them coming here maybe i mean we probably have to ask them that question it certainly it certainly couldn't have hurt mm. um i think the thing with the WNBL and attracting high quality imports is the league has actually been attracting high quality mm. for a long time it seems to get better year on year, and I and I think that's probably down to a few things, and perhaps the World Cup has had a part of that. But our league is, you know, arguably up there in, you know, second or third best league in the world, only behind the WNBA and, you know, perhaps a European league or two. We play in the summer. Um, they can come over here. They have an incredible um, professional training and playing environment. Our coaching quality over here is as good as it gets. It's world class. So they're coming over. They're playing with world class athletes. Most of the Opals play. They're getting coached by world class coaches. They're playing in the summer. Uh, it's not like the WNBA where they play every second or third day. So they might they play once a week, maybe twice a week if they're lucky. Um, for the most part, they get put up in great accommodation and provided with great living. Um, living experiences, and then just get to experience the, the Australian lifestyle. So whether they're in Perth or in Melbourne or Sydney, wherever it might be, um, it's a pretty cool place to come and, you know, in inverted commas, work, which is what they're here for, but also get mm. to experience the Australian lifestyle. And then off the back of that, we do know that the athletes that come over here and that do participate go back and talk to, to others about it. So the WNBL has such a good reputation as a league to go and play in for all of those reasons. And it's more, I genuinely think it's it's a lot of word of mouth um, from the athletes that have been here in the past um, and just also the general quality, right? You've all, Opals, like you say, WNBA players, we were fortunate in the last season to have a Japanese international. We had three Canadian internationals. So um, I expect that the quality of our import athletes will continue to get better and better year on year, especially as we start to have an even closer connection um, and partnership with the WNBA, which, you know, we will be looking to evolve that partnership in terms of what that looks like year on year as well. Mm, for sure. So so it's just like the continued ongoing success of the domestic product that you feel is a, the biggest contributing factor. I think so. I mean, there's no doubt the World Cup would have helped it, right? Yeah. Um, no doubt. It certainly helped just the the general interest and in, in coverage of women's basketball across the country. Um, I don't know if that's the sole factor, though. I do mm -hmm. genuinely think it's the experience experiences that those in the past have had and we do you know we know when when you recruit athletes to come over here they talk to others they'll reach out and say hey I know you went to Australia last year or the year before what did you think and very rarely is there a negative to say about it it's always so positive so look even you know we hear from athletes as well when they go over to the European leagues <clears throat> there's issues with things like pay um, they're playing in the winter it's freezing cold so mm. Um, we know at the moment from a pay perspective we can't compete with some of those European leagues and that's that's just the reality of where things are at right now. So um, we can't compete with the pay but we can provide all of that other kind of package rolled up which is, you know, enticing for athletes I suppose. Yeah, for sure. And being able to deliver that product and like, yeah, to be like you can be a part of this like world-class product mm -hmm. because it is, it's some of the best basketball in the world. Uh, I remember after a game in the Eurobasket, the Serbian head coach, uh, Marina Mal Maljukovic. I'm, I'm sure I'm not getting that exactly <laughs> right. 
but she mentioned that the that um her country Serbia needed a stronger domestic product um and she also said that uh you can't fix all of the country's issues at the international level so i guess in, you know in australia to um you know start contrast of that where we're ticking both of those boxes um and <clears throat> how do you feel as though on the international level the opals are not only representing yeah australian basketball and the very best we have but the domestic product we have yeah i mean look the opals at the moment rank third in the world their success internationally over gosh however long now has mm. been phenomenal um you know I know everyone was super excited when the Boomers won bronze at the last Olympics, and I was too because I'm a basketball fan, but she was the Opal's success internationally has been second to none. We've won gold medals at a World Cup, right? So um, genuinely we're always up there in medal contention. We love that as Aussies because we bat way above our average in terms of, you know, our population size and so on. And so um, there's no doubt that the WNBL um, is a pathway to the Opals and every every person in the Opal squad as it currently stands either currently plays or has played in the WNBL. Mm. So it's the genuine pathway. The quality of that domestic competition, no doubt, flows on to then the international success um, and provides the pathway as well for a lot of athletes to go on and play in the WNBA. And I think this year, depending on who makes it with a few training contracts and bits and pieces, um, you know, we'll have anywhere from, from kind of seven athletes in the WNBA this season, um, potentially more. So, you know, incredible stuff from from a, from a I suppose, women's basketball perspective. But, yeah, that domestic competition, obviously having that at a high quality is is hugely impactful on how your team performs at the international level. Um, and, I, interestingly, I had, a, I had a meeting with the Japanese Basketball Association last week and we're talking specifically about this and they, they're debating about whether they bring imports into their league, which they currently don't have, and they're asking about how that works for us and, and, and what we think about it and, you know, it's an interesting concept because, um, you know, in the hub season, in the 2020 hub for the WNBL, we had no imports because it was in COVID and, you know, arguably, you know, it was as good as a competition as we've ever seen. And I remember thinking at the end of that, God, I don't know if we need them because Australian basketball is hmm. so good and our athletes are so good that are that that doesn't make a difference. And then the imports came back the next season and then I went, yeah, that it does make a difference because... <laughs> Um, they are, you know, I mean, looks, lots of our Aussies are, are as, at the same level, I would say, as some of them, but but it really elevates the league. It helps the league become a global um, a global league as well, not just a domestic league. Um, and so I think it genuinely um, elevates it and genuinely improves the competition, So, which is what I shared with the Japanese league. And mm. so whatever they whether they do it or not, I don't know. Um, but it's an, it is interesting. And then you look about at the evolution of domestic leagues and you look at what the NBL's done and they have um, imports that can come, um, you know, from the FIBA Asia region. I think they can have up to four imports now, which is an interesting concept. I don't think we'd ever get to that because we we do want the WNBL to be a pathway for Australian athletes and, and mm. certainly the Opals as well. Um, yeah, but lots, I mean, lots to think through, but I do, I do think that the league is a great, um, barometer and great platform for, for international success for our Opals. And I do hope, I think they'll, you know, they should medal at this Olympics this year. It's just a matter of what color. Yeah. I, I, there's a few things you said there that I, I wanted to, um, come back, back around to, but I think at least over my lifetime, we don't have a better team than the opals like there's 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 these um these teams like have their their moments and then they grow on that or or they don't or it just peters out uh and then you know we always have some like cinderella story quote unquote it's like they could medal this year the opals should medal like every every single competition we should be we should be on the podium at the end and you know that might be a lot of pressure but it also just might be that's where we are like that's where we are in the landscape of international basketball um yeah, I got to speak with uh, Kayla George before the season started and she said, yeah, she just wants to get on the podium. It's the only thing she hasn't done. This was two weeks after she won uh, a WNBA championship. So, like, yeah. first of all, why is she talking to me? But then also, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was also so awesome to hear that, like, as someone that has had this incredible career, how, how much, how important that that um, that medal at the Olympics is, yeah, yeah. for her. Well, I, you know, Kayla and Tess and the, the other Opals, the last Olympics for them was really difficult with um you know Liz Cambage 
cunt pulling out a week before and all the drama that was associated with that, um, really hard for them. And, you know, when it, it's a four-year cycle, mm. when you're leading up to something and you put all this effort in and everything's in place and you're good to go and you're expected to meddle and then you have something, um, you know, quite so significant happen mm. before and which really impacted all of them like they were heartbroken they genuinely were heartbroken and so they have a point to prove um especially those women that were there at those last olympics um and i have no doubt that they will get out there and do that and it's pretty exciting and look you know america for both the men and the women in basketball is still number one in the world and, and you know mm. rightfully so but they're not unbeatable. And certainly in the women, they're, they're not on um, the men's team. I don't know. I saw that one day. Maybe they are unbeatable. Um, <laughs> if Australia gets to the gold medal game and they, they play the US, that they're beatable. Our, our women are good enough to beat them. They've beat them before. So, um, yeah, I just I can't wait to see it. I think it's going to be awesome. Yeah. Um, I think, I think yeah, Sarah Blitzavs, uh, I had her on an episode as well, and she, yeah. she said that... Um, the, the I was talking about the China game in the World Cup and she said it was like it was really heartbreaking uh yeah. but then also it felt like China um making it to the gold medal match uh, uh I don't want to misquote her so let's just say this yeah. is my interpretation of what she said that yeah. was kind of the win for them but yes. the Opals really felt like like if they were to make the gold medal match silver wouldn't silver wouldn't be good enough and they wanted like an actual like a puncher's chance to take down the states um, yes. But still, you know, you got the got the rose gold in pretty. I mean, on the back of Lauren Jackson scoring thirty points, it was pretty awesome. That that, that showed itself. Yeah, absolutely. I was at that game, and I mean, it's an interesting one with basketball, right? Because you, you make that gold medal game, and you get a silver for losing the game. Mm. It's kind of bittersweet, right? I kind of feel at least with the bronze, you've won a game and to, mm. to get something. So, well, I think that it was an amazing tournament. Um, you know, LJ coming back, hitting thirty in that. That bronze medal game was unbelievable. And uh, so, you know, there's no doubt they would have been happy with that. And that was off the back of the kind of disappointing Olympics. But uh, they'll be wanting to do better than that at this Olympics. And they have the team to do it. So uh, let's see how they go. Yeah. So how are you feeling just as a fan, just generally as a fan of the Opals uh, going into the Olympics? Oh, I'm, I'm super excited. And I am a fan. I love, I love you know, watching the Opals play. Um, I love how good we are. I love how many WNBA athletes we have. I mean, you think back over the years, I don't think this, I don't, I don't know if this is actually the case, but surely we're, we're almost at the most athletes we've ever had in the WNBA. I know for the men, it's the case with Aussies in the NBA. And so it just, we're just elevating even more, I think, mm. as a the country so watching all of those athletes um you know i worked with a lot of the, the current opals at when i was at the boomers in you know kayla and tess and izzy so um, i know them and i just i just really want to see them be successful and also they're just they're just great to watch and look the, i suppose the big question on everyone's um mouth is lj is she gonna play and obviously <laughs> Uh, I ask her all the time and she gives me the same answer as the media, which is she doesn't know yet. Um, <laughs> would love to see her play. I think, you know, genuinely, you know, I'm sure you watched the WNBL finals. She's playing as good as she ever has. She deserves to be there. She is in our best 12 athletes. Um, I know she's just considering it with, you know, family considerations. Mm. So, um, gosh, and it, uh, you know, I will, I will watch whether she is there or not, but I'm sure there'll be a lot more interest if she is there, just given who she is. And I think um, I think that can only help with interest in the Opals and interest in, you know, women's basketball off the back of it as well. Yeah. And, like, not only is she one of our 12 best players, too, I, there's just, like, this experience and this calm and this poise that she has that um, I feel like in the Brazil game it was quite pronounced in the OQT. Mm -hmm uh it was it, that seemed like a pretty intense environment and just her being on the court catching the ball you just feel like the, the team takes a breath and no matter how the that play ends up the next five minutes after that is just like at this controlled more controlled pace and controlled tempo um so yeah it'd be it'd be a huge bonus to have her uh on the team um oh and this is another thing you said before talking about imports in the league and um yeah, their impact. Uh, the, yeah, the final, and, and you just mentioned the finals. The finals were unbelievable. Mm. And Perth were up 1-0 and had a wide open fast break and two free throws to close it out and win and win against the Flyers and, like, win the league. 
um, against the Flyers. And, you know, amazing shot by Mercedes Russell, buzzer beater to win game two. And then game three was just, you know, wire to wire south side. Uh, but I, I think the basketball fan in me was like, oh, you got to go, you know, it's got to be Perth. It's got to be Perth. You know, they're the, they're the underdog, quote unquote. Um, and, you know, they're coming up against a stacked team. But then, you know, reflecting on the season, it's like, wait, that stacked team was mainly Aussies. Like they had great imports in Dickie and Russell, but like the majority of the rotation was mainly Australians. Um, so yeah, I guess, I guess, I guess, I guess, yeah, growing the domestic product and like, you know, grassroots uh, clubs and stuff like that. I think that that ends up uh, getting you the best possible quality league. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you're right on reflection, you know, um, quality imports in, in you know probably both of those outfits in Perth and Southside but great Australian talent around them as well and um, you know we've got a great pathway in Australia for developing talent which you know one of those being obviously all the you know the junior championships the state level national level sorry and then you know see at the COE the Centre of Excellence up at the AIS um, you know producing just world-class athletes year after year um, and then others that kind of take different pathways and might come through the college system and you know, Steph Reed, I think, is a great story about, you know, not making state junior teams and going to college and then, you know, being a DP. And then she has just worked her butt off. She's had mm-hmm. great coach and now, you know, she's part of the Opal. So there's no, I mean, there, there's obviously a pathway through that centre of excellence in AIS, but it, but if you're not there, it doesn't mean you still can't make it. So mm-hmm. I love her story and that there are other stories like that as well. But, yeah, it's important to keep producing more um more elite level athletes and so you know we do that here in australia we certainly have some support inadvertently through the american college system Hmm. um but then you know we haven't touched on the the wmba draft that was yeah um, last week as well and two current wmbl athletes one x you know just some sensational all three of those women sensational basketball players and how exciting is that really for the future you think about the future of the opals the young women coming through my gosh very mm. excited yeah yeah let's talk about it uh potch and ball lays going to atlanta shelly going to phoenix how do you how do you feel about that we had the potch was in the first round um yeah. And, and I would say, clearly I'm biased, I think Izzy Borle should have been in the first round as well. I, I think getting her at 20 was a steal for Atlanta mm. um, because she's ready to go now. She, you yeah. know, she saw her WNBL season last season and her debut for the Opals. She could play WNBA now. I, I don't think she's going to go over this year. I think she's going to sit the year out maybe go the next year. Mm. I'm not sure if um, Potch is going to do the same. Um, like I, I felt like a proud mum watching them get <laughs> um, drafted because I know both of these young ladies just through my role and they're both, um, yeah, outside of being great basketball players, they're both just great people and great young women and I think have a, you know, obviously going to have a really long career in basketball in Australia and mm. internationally. And um, so it was just really, it was lovely to see their names get called. I think it's so cool that they've both gone to Atlanta because mm. what about the Aussie connection? We've got there now with Gori as a, an assistant coach. Um, so when they both get on that roster, which they will at, at, in time, um, a great opportunity for Australian basketball fans to, to watch these two young ladies play um play for the Atlanta Dream and then Jazz Shelley going to Phoenix and gosh I hope she makes that roster because it's a it's a mm. crazy good roster yeah. um with great coaching and she can play like she's a baller so um I'd, I'd be really fascinated to see her um you know I suppose her trajectory but you know she's she's a future opal as well and really exciting just for the you know the future state of the opals the future state of the WNBL we obviously want all these young women playing in the WNBL and we'll We'll uh, uh, obviously hope that that is the case, but um, it just it just shows in you know in a how many do they draft thirty six thirty six mm. draftees three of those being Aussies like that. Mm, I mean true you know, man we just bat way above our average and we love to see it yeah yeah uh, I loved Potch's interview she just had it all she had like she's obviously very nervous which you know you you would be you'd probably want to just be celebrating that moment. But then yeah. uh, I just, I feel like the rawness she showed was just, it was just awesome. It was such a nice, like, it was different from all the other interviews. Um, yeah, it was just, it was just nice to see that. And then, yeah, Borlase is, I mean, I feel like her first minutes, either like Kayla or Tolo or maybe even LJ was on the court and she was like, get out of my way. <laughs> I'm, I'm yeah. taking the ball to the rim. Um, and did you, were you at uh, the Boomers at the same time as Jazz Shelley? 
No, I think she'd left just the year before. Oh, okay. I didn't have any crossover with her. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, it's, it's you know, it's it always been a great time to be an Aussie basketball fan and it's just getting more and more exciting. The NBA moves so quickly these days, it's hard to keep up. Shams and Woj are breaking stories left and right, but the quick time out is right there with them to keep you informed on the latest NBA news. Stop in and let us break it down as it happens. Find the quick time out on the Deep 2 Podcast Network. On this most previous um, WNBL season, uh, what what do you, yeah, just general thoughts and feelings on, on the season that just passed, I, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I think generally it was a fantastic season all round it's the first season we've had without any I'm going to say major issues or major disruptions so obviously we had COVID there for a few years which was bloody hell for us and for all other professional sporting leagues just Mm. a hard slog and hard to get through and you know really disruptive um and then you know the season before last we had some really significant broadcast issues in the first four to five rounds which were horrific um then the season just gone um it, it, it ran really well, was delivered really well by all of the clubs and everyone who kind of works behind the scenes at the league. Um, Broadcast-wise, it was really good. Um, we had we had a great broadcast delivery and some really strong support from our broadcast partners in ESPN and Nine, great media coverage, you know, like I mentioned. The quality of imports that we had were just exciting. I loved watching Aaron McDonald and Jordan Canada play. They were just electric. Mm. Um, and then in saying that, that then lifts the quality, you know, of all the athletes playing around them. I loved seeing the breakout seasons we had from a number of athletes. And we have an award, which is um, Breakout Player of the Year, which was won by Alex Sharp. But, gee, you know, it could have gone, there were so many athletes it could have gone to. I think um, Amy Atwell had an incredible mm. breakout season. I think Mila Goodchild had a breakout season, you know, Izzy Borlaser arguably had had yet another breakout season, um, Courtney Woods up in Townsville. So there were some athletes that really, you know, I suppose made their mark this season significantly and so, so great to watch that. Um, all of the teams were great to watch and I think as a, you know, say as a WNBL fan in general, you um, any game, there was no given in any game. So mm. the difference between the top and the bottom wasn't big. And, you know, the Caps who, you know, finished, you know, didn't win that many games but were competitive in all games and are just getting better year on year. Despite that, um, they were competitive. So there was, you know, there was never a, a team that would go to play Canberra, I'm sure, which thought this is a guaranteed win. Absolutely not. And, my God, the style of basketball that they play um, was so entertaining and as a as a you know, people who watched the Caps, the Caps sold out their games nearly every home game mm. and they weren't winning. They weren't winning many games. So it speaks a lot to the type of basketball they were playing, the, the work they were doing in the community to engage with their fans. Um, so in general, um, I, I think it was a great season. I had a, I had a um, one of the journos reach out to me about, oh, must be two thirds of the way through the season and say, hey, you know, it's going well. What do you think? Blah, blah, blah. And I said, you know, it's going really well. And they said, look, there's no drama. Can, can we do something to generate a bit of drama? And I was like, what do you mean? What are you going to fabricate anything? But, you know, for the most part it was drama-free, which is on one hand good because we have a, you know, a really good season that's been delivered really well by everybody. But on the other hand, the media was saying, well, we need, we need something. And I said, hey, how about you just talk about how amazing the league is and the athletes are and not focus on, you know, drama um, but I get it right they, they work in media and they have to you know sell stories and sell newspapers and you mm-hmm. know whatever it is. so um but yeah look really pleased our, our we're just getting all of our finalizing all of our um reporting at the end of last season but all of our all of our um targeted metrics are up so our media coverage membership across the clubs was up 20 percent our digital engagement was up significantly I can't recall the number off the top of my head um, you know, that the app will finish up with about 10,000 downloads in year one, which is just phenomenal. I think we engaged with about 2,500 Aussie Hoopers directly engaging them with the WNBL. Um, so, so across the board in all of our um, metrics, uh, sorry, game attendances were up. Most people ever through the doors in the history mm. of the WNBL, we had over 150,000 people through. Our broadcast figures are still coming in, but that will be up significantly from last season as well so it was a really good season of growth across the board we are still way off 
where we should be. That's just the reality of where we're at with the WNBL. So we are growing, but we're mm. growing off a base which isn't high. So um, at least we're going in the right direction. Um, but then we look to, you know, almost like WNBL 2.0 is, is on the radar with some new ownership and governance and investment coming into the league in this off season, mm-hmm. um, which is going to provide, it's not going to be a, you know, a magic bullet, but it is going to provide a real opportunity for the WNBL to, to not just grow, you know, at a, at a nice steady pace, but to really take some leaps and bounds and, you know, put itself up in the top of the pile when it comes to kind of women's professional sport in, in our country. So some, some really, I think some, it's been a great season, but there are some really exciting times ahead. Yeah, definitely. I feel like, I feel like, well, first of all, I feel like, you know, there's enough, of, there's enough to celebrate in basketball. You don't need to drum up drama. Like there's, there's so <laughs> many storylines happening at, at any, yeah. at any given point. Um, but I feel like all eight teams have, a direction and they're all building towards something. I mean, six of them had either the same record as, or a better record than the Perth Lynx, who we just said nearly won the league. Mm. And then the other two in the, the lightning of Adelaide and the capitals of Canberra, Adelaide were, were struck by um, not having Steph Talbot for, um, oh, well, it would have been like 15 games probably or yeah. thereabouts. And they were still able to, yeah, produce a really good um, quality of basketball, having Brianna Turner just dishing out assists from the top of the key and then ripping down every rebound and then somehow stopping people that seemed like they had, you know, sometimes 20 kilos on her. And she did it like yeah. with ease. Um, but they, they they were just, I think they they played a really good style of basketball and they still ended up going, I think, 8 and 13. And then yep. Canberra, yeah, as you said, such an exciting brand of basketball. I think the term superstar is probably thrown about around too liberally in the basketballing world, but they have a superstar in Jade Melbourne uh, and she's only going to get better. And then, yeah, Alex Sharp was just causing chaos on um, the O glass and they were just, pl- they were playing. So like they, they, they were in every game. They made it. Um, you, you, yeah, you couldn't just come in and, and take a win against Canberra. Uh, but I think it was that inexperience that at the last five minutes of every game, it was just like, ah, you, there's, there's a team of like, you know, young up and comers and there's a team that's built to win and, you know, just, yeah. just go on autopilot until the end of the game. Um, yeah. But that, yeah, that must be great as the, as the head of the WNBL to have all eight teams going in a direction that's positive. Yeah, absolutely. And like you said, I mean, you know, Adelaide put Steph Talbot in Adelaide for that whole season mm. and gosh, who knows what could happen? Cause you know, they were a great team. Um, and she's a world-class athlete, of course, like she's incredible. So, and then the Caps will get the Caps, you know, hopefully they keep that core young group, the up and coming group together. And, you know, Vili is a great, great coach and they clearly have a lot of respect for her and what she's doing there. And, you know, Capitals are, a, are an incredibly successful club over the history of the WNBL and they'll be building. They're building mm-hmm. towards, you know, success in the coming years. And, and every team has its own kind of strategy. And, you know, you saw Southside with, they went through experience this year and it paid off Mm. like you know that the experience in that roster absolutely is what helped them get over the line whether it's Mercedes shooting a buzzer beater or Lalani just controlling the game you know she got better as the season went on and just just control the whole game so you, you know a mixture of youth and experience clearly is um, clearly is needed, and you know maybe a, maybe an experienced head in that caps lineup might be mm-hmm. good for them. Who knows? Who knows how they recruit for next season? Um, but yeah, it is pleasing to see, and you know everyone wants to win. Every you know that's that's why people play. That's you know the ultimate goal for most clubs. But um, there's other measures of success in WNBL clubs as well. And when you think about you know I mentioned the Capitals before, sellout crowds, outstanding community work, um, great corporate sponsorship and government partnerships so they're doing a really good job in that program as are lots of the other clubs um um, which hopefully then will lead to some more success for them on court in the years to come yeah for sure um i remember that i lost my i lost my place about 10 minutes ago but i I remember where where i was trying to go we were on the WNBA, and just the australian representation or even just the australian uh connection that pretty much every team has like the aces kayla was the starter on the championship clinching game. I'm sure that's enough to get a couple of Ace, uh, Aussie Aces fans. Sandy's yeah. the, Sandy Brundell is the coach of the Liberty. Um, I mean, Christy Wallace in Indiana, they had Aaliyah Boston uh, last year as the first overall pick and then the point guard from Iowa this past draft. Yeah. Uh, Alana Smith now in Minnesota. Um, yeah. 
Uh, yeah, the the pair in Atlanta. I mean, Seattle is sixty percent Aussie every yeah. single season. Uh, I'm missing a couple of teams there, but like, there's going to be so few games you put on, and you don't see an Aussie probably get court time. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I guess yeah, that's a testament to to the the quality of the of the domestic league as well because so many of them have had reps in the WNBL. Absolutely. I think that's the thing too, right? We've got a lot of athletes over there and they're not just their, their, their players, right? Mm. They're, you know, Ezzy's a superstar, of course, but mm. then, you know, Sammy plays big minutes at Seattle. Jade, Jade got more and more minutes, you know, last season and I expect she'll get more. And then all the others that you mentioned over there as well, you know, that they play, they're not there to, to warm the bench at all. Mm. Um, so, and again, it just speaks volumes for the quality of athletes we have here in Australia, the quality of the, the WNBL, the quality of the Opals program. Um, there's a huge Aussie flavour in the WNBA now, you know, as you said, not just from players, but coaches. You've got Sandy over there, you've got Paul Goris over there. Um, I expect we'll probably see some more coaches at some point in time go mm. over to the WNBA as well. Um, so it's a really exciting space. And I think the more the WNBA is about to go through and an, another big growth boom off the back of the Caitlin Clark effect, um, which, again, can only help us here in Australia, both domestically and, and with the Opals internationally. So it's a really a really exciting space in general for women's basketball right now. We, you know, we generally follow the States when it comes to these types of things. Mm. Um, basketball in itself in Australia through uh, participation is just booming. It is absolutely booming. And then this, this, the interest and success of Aussies in the NBA and the WNBA flows through then to Opals and Boomers and then to the domestic leagues. So uh, you look, it is just, it's just about to boom. And I think even, you know, selfishly, I think the Caitlin, you know, the Caitlin Clark, how do we benefit, how do we in Australia benefit off something like that? And I think um, there's a couple of things. We're going to have Christy Wallace playing with her this year mm. in the WNBA, which will be one part. But also, you know, Caitlin Clark was named in the US squad for the Olympics and I, I'm really hoping she gets picked to mm. go because it just creates such media attention for for women's basketball and then also if and when we come up against them in the Olympics the Opals playing against her my god there's so much that you can so much interest you can generate off the back of that um and then look we can only hope right why, why can't we get Caitlin Clark playing out here in the WNBL next season or the season after that you know that's what we should be aiming to do mm -hmm. so you know I think I just think the the opportunity for us is enormous at the moment mm -hmm. we're just you know we're on this wave upwards um yeah there's a there's I think it's going to be huge in the next couple of years yeah that's it that's that would be awesome having her in Australia would be crazy I think uh they've already the WNBA has already rescheduled a few of the Fever's games from 12,000 to 20,000 seat yeah. arenas because I think they've either sold out or they were tracking to sell out, so they just rescheduled them. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, to go back to, you know, dramatizing the sport, uh, the the personality uh, that Wally has, um, when you put that in the same lineup as, you know, Alia Boston, who's this very uh, patient considered very smart player um, and kind of, yeah, you know, she's not, not that she's not like physical and doesn't, you know, you're not going to push her off her block, but I think she's a bit more of like a, a finesse big. Yeah. And Clark is, you know, she, you know, she, she's not even going to enter the arc and get finished the game with 30 points. So then to get Wally just cutting like right through that as like the enforcer from the wing or the other guard spot, it's going to yeah. be, it's, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a talking point. It's a talking point for basketball fans. It's going to be great to watch, isn't it? Really? Yeah, definitely. It'll be yeah, amazing. It will be. Um, uh, aside from getting uh, Caitlin Clark in a WNBL jersey, <laughs> what 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 um you you spoke on the recent success of the of the league, but what's on the horizon for the WNBL? Yeah, I mean it, it, it. It's really exciting times ahead, and um, you know, certainly it's quite public knowledge around um the change in ownership model of the WNBL that's currently underway. So Basketball Australia, um commissioned a report about 18 months ago on on the status of the WNBL and and a review of the ownership model and um, suggestions for a way forward to enable that to be successful and where that's landed is that the basketball street board has endorsed a new ownership and governance model of the league and and what that will look like um, I suppose kind of in simple terms is that um, a new entity will be created a new company 
let's call it WNBL Co for the sake of it, um, that will sit separate to Basketball Australia. So the WNBL mm-hmm. currently sits directly, um, you know, I suppose as a vertical NBA, um, wholly and solely owned and delivered by Basketball Australia um, to, to, I suppose, to allow it the capacity to grow the the board and through this research and, and review has recognised that it, it needs something different and that something different is the creation of the new entity. Um, now, with that entity, Basketball Australia will still own a portion of it, a percentage of it, but, um, and you may have seen in the media last week, the, the press release went out last week, they that uh, we've appointed a, a lead advisor in Eagle Hawk who will go out in the coming weeks and months to seek capital investment into the WML. And that capital investment uh, could be one investment group, could be multiple. Um, could be individuals, could be consortiums, could be media entities. Um, so that will that will create some capital for the league, this kind of new WNBL co over here, um, and, and really provide it with some resource, both people and money, to be able to grow. So there's a lot of work going on around this kind of new, you know, WNBL 2.0 uh, that we're kind of calling it over here. Um, from my perspective, it absolutely was needed and it's not to say um that BA haven't you know done a good job they've done a, as good a job as they can with the WNBL over you know the period that they've had it but the the reality of it is is it, there are limited resources both in people and money so to grow you need resources right mm. so you know might take my hat off to the BA board and, and Alacria who's the consultancy that have done all this work and continue to work on this project um the recognition at, that that something needs to change. The the review of sporting models, both domestically and globally, and, and the recommendations of those models and the working through those models to determine best way forward. Um, there is an advantage to us being, you know, as you know, as saying in inverted commas, you know, a last mover. Um, we're, we're, we have been slow to this process, mm-hmm. but the benefit of that is we've seen what all the other leagues, again, both domestically and globally around the world have done in, um, the formation of entities and what's worked and what hasn't. So there's a lot of learnings from that type of thing. Um, the thing that excites me is um, the interest in the WNBL. So this has been on the cards now, you know, 18 months, give or take, um, and we're now at the point where where that lead advisor has been appointed. It is public knowledge that we'll be going out to seek private investment into the WNBL. The interest in the league of people, consortiums, groups, entities that are interested in coming in to to buy a percentage of the league is off the charts, right? And I would have said if you would have even five years ago if we would have done this process, the interest would be minimal. Right now the interest is, is like it is just so exciting and, you know, cons- you know, I can't say much more than that, but there are a lot of, there is such a lot of interest in it and there is a lot of interest in it for the right reasons in that they they can see the growth trajectory of the WNBL. They want to be part of that. They want to contribute to that growth. Um, so it's really, really exciting to see what that's going to look like. And so that when that process is finished, you've got an entity over here which is um, partially owned by BA. They retain some percentage. You'll have some private investment that's partially owned. You may have some clubs that own a small percentage of that. That's kind of still being worked through. And then sitting above that, you know, you have an independent um, board whose job is wholly and solely on, you know, the the delivery and growth of the WNBL. So right now in in the BA model, the Basketball Australia board has a lot on their plate, which is not just the WNBL. The WNBL is just one of, you know, kind of 20 things that they've got. So um, having that singular focus, we know... um, that's a model that works. Um, So I'm very excited about that. You know, I really genuinely want to see the WNBL be incredibly successful. We know the on-court product is already there, right? We know we are globally, and like you said, you can go and watch a basketball game, a WNBL game, and it is as good as it gets. You are watching international superstars right in front of you. So the on-court product is amazing. It's all the stuff we do around it that we've got to grow, and this is going to provide us with the opportunity to do that. It's not going to happen overnight, but, it, but you know, it, over the, you know, the next kind of two to three years, it will happen. <laughs> so from my perspective, um, I, I'm just very excited and I'm thrilled for, you know, 
everyone that's involved in the league at what this opportunity is going to present and where it's potentially going to take the league. I think, you know, again, I'm biased, but I think we have the best female women's pro league in terms of the on-court product in the country and it is a, is a genuine global product as well um and i think we should be the best women's professional league in the country and that's not to say i don't want the other leagues to not be successful i think we should all be very successful but um you know the WNBL was the first women's pro league in the country and then you know we've been around 44 years and we've seen the introduction of netball and we've seen the introduction of aflw and nrlw and the a leagues and um you know for the most part they've all leapfrogged us and and we we haven't caught up because we haven't had the resources to to stay with them um so this is this is why this new this new entity needs to happen and is going to happen and it's why it's really really exciting to see where the WNBL will be in the next one, two, three, four, five years. It's it's an exciting place for us all. Man, what an incredible response to, I, I guess this is a great place to finish it. I'm not going to try and add anything to that. That was awesome. I was so captivated while you were speaking just then. Um, you can tell I'm what, about it. <laughs> pardon me? You can tell that I'm very passionate about it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's it's it's, it's an exciting time. I, I'm I'm. It's making me look forward to it. I mean, if this is where the product is and you, you think that they can go to these like great heights and, the amount of energy and effort and just everything that's going into it. It's, 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 it's exciting. It's promising. It's, um, it's exciting. It's, it's great as, it's great as a basketball fan. It's great as a sports fan. It's great as an Aussie. Like it's just, it's just awesome. Yeah, it is mate. It is like, it is very, it is very exciting. Like, like there's a lot of work to do, but my God, we're, we're going in the right direction. The global interest in the sport, the domestic participation rates, the general interest and then, you know, this this new WNBL entity which is going to provide us with platform and resource to grow, it is genuinely exciting and I can't wait to see where it takes it. Definitely. Uh, Chrissy, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate that. That was an amazing episode. Oh, thank you. You're very welcome. Anytime. Happy to chat. Cheers. Thank you. What's the deal?